The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Sonia, thank you, Michelle, for that uh, kind introduction. Well, it's really my deep and great pleasure to introduce my friend Jordi Puig Sorry from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He's an aerospace professor there and an aerospace technology developer and co inventor of the CubeSat standard, which uh, we're going to uh, learn all about the development from, uh, from his talk uh, this evening. He's also a uh, co founder of Tyvac Nanosatellite Systems, also in San Luis Obispo. Uh, as of 2009, uh, Jordi has participated in five satellite development efforts and the launch of seven spacecraft missions. And in particular, um, there's work that uh, he and his students are involved in uh, for our Earth Science Technology Office, which is very exciting for us within NASA. In 2011, uh, he and Scott McGillivray, uh, he was a former manager of the NASA satellite program for Boeing Phantom Works, established Tyvac Nanolite Systems and uh, to sell uh, miniature avionics packages for small satellites uh, with the goal to increase the volume and availability uh, for various payloads. Uh, Jordi, as I mentioned, was co-inventor of the CubeSat uh, reference design, uh, along with Professor Bob Twiggs, um, uh, formerly of Stanford University. Uh, and their goal was to enable graduate students to build, uh, design, and test, and operate in a space environment of these systems with capabilities similar to that of the first spacecraft, Sputnik. Uh, over time, the CubeSat design has emerged as an industry standard, and it's widely adopted by universities, companies, and government agencies around the world. Uh, the first CubeSats were launched into low Earth orbit in June of 2003, and as of August 2012, approximately 75 CubeSats have been placed uh, into orbit, and the number, as we all know, is going rapidly. Uh, so with that introduction, it's uh, again my pleasure to welcome Jordi. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles, and thank you to the Keck um, Institute for, for, for making this, this happen. And this is actually an interesting um, event for me because it's, it's, it's a longer lecture than I usually get to do in conferences. It's always, you know, you have 15 minutes and go really quick. Um, but at the same time, it gives me a chance to kind of look back and not just be talking about exactly what's happening today, but, but think about where CubeSat came from and what happened. And that's what I would like to share with you today. Um, very informally, I'm going to try not to go into a lot of technical detail. It's more of a philosophy uh, talk. If you have a question, just, just stop me. Uh, we, we have time, and we should be able to do that. Um, so anyway, so what I wanted to say is, is the CubeSat is an unlikely success story. And, and at this point, a lot of people have become familiar with CubeSat as, as something that is great. But, but a lot of people are not aware of how things were at the beginning. So that's what I'm going to try to talk a little bit about. Um, what happened and why it happened. And, and, and I don't like outlines, but, but I'll, it's long enough that I'll put one. So we will talk a little bit about what the CubeSat is. We'll look at. It shouldn't have worked, really. Um, but it did work, and why? And then, and then so what? Um, so there are some lessons learned. And there is, there is some things that may translate into the more general technology field, or at least in aerospace. So that, that's what I want to point with my, with my lessons learned. Not so much what CubeSats do, but, but so what? How does that affect everybody else? Um, so let's look at student satellites as, as education tools, because that's really what started CubeSat. Okay? And, 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 and if you look at it, that, that a lot of people do spacecraft design. You do a paper design, you have really nice CAT tools, and you get your drawings, and you do all your analysis. And it's a really fabulous exercise uh, for the students. Um, but it's still a paper study. But it's easy. You need a few computers, a lab, a bunch of students. You lock them up, they'll come up with something. Um, the next step is to get into subsystem development. And that's a little harder. That's why it's yellow now. Because now you need some hardware, and that is, is more difficult, and it requires more resources. So less people do that. Um, and when you do it, you encounter difficulties that are not there uh, when you're just doing paper studies. 
Well, the ultimate is to do integrations, integration of an entire system testing and ultimately flying it, but I'm just stopping there. Just actually putting together a complete integrated satellite system is a huge change from, from that subsystem development. Uh, in terms of the quantity, quality, and background of the students you need, the resources you need to put into it, the time you need to put into it, the unknowns that go into it. So it's, it's a much harder problem. However, the rewards are huge. If you get to do this, you're really training people at a different level of competence than when you're just doing the other pieces. So, so it's important to do this. Let's agree to that. It's a good thing. Now how do we do it? Well, where were we before, um, before CubeSat? And, and I, Jamie's around here. He'll recognize that one. Um, that's Opal and it's, that's Sapphire, I think, where Stanford uh, small satellites. That's ASU Sat one. I worked on that when I was in Arizona. Um, the, the problem was we had very long development times. There were relatively bigger systems. They were um, more complex. Um, the timeline was a problem for the students because they graduated before seeing the system finish, which means a lot of them didn't get to that integration and testing point. They were still in the, in the subsystem level. But it's also hard for professors. It's hard to um, um, get yourself into a project that may last five or six years and then wait three or four more years for, for launch. Um, and you don't have papers to publish because you don't have the results. And, and it's kind of a a risky proposition, especially for young faculty that are starting. So, so that was a problem as well. Um, they turn out to be too costly and complex. The students really could get themselves into a lot of trouble by making a, a complex system. Um, there were very few launches available. I mean, it was a very rare occasion when, when student satellites uh, launch. And that also meant that there was a very small number of universities that were doing this. Uh, Stanford was doing great. Weber State did it for a while. Um, but it was not something that was popular and anybody could do it. Um, so Bob and I, we were both working on these kinds of boxes and we saw the, the, the problems with them. And from an educational perspective, there was a motivation to change something. Um, so what we decided to do is we got together and, and we started in 99. Really, the first standard spec came out in 2000. Um, but the idea is to make it easier. And, and the first thing we meant by easier is, is make it fast. So a student in a couple of years in a master's uh, timeline could design, build, fly a spacecraft. For the most part, we didn't know if that was possible or not. But that was the objective. Uh, we wanted to lower the cost. And we decided a good thing was make it smaller so they cannot get themselves into as much trouble and make it as complicated. And also, it's just a smaller box. It's easier to launch as well. We knew that launch vehicle flexibility was important. It was hard to get onto a launch vehicle. And we had all these custom boxes. Everybody was doing their own little size. Uh, and that meant you needed to find a, a nook and cranny on a launch vehicle for your specific spacecraft. And that was, that was difficult. Um, so we decided to try to use standards. And at the time, there was this big standards in spacecraft would come up and go away and come up and go away. And, and they really never went an anywhere. Um, the, the mission always took priority. Um, so, but we decided to give it a try. It was primarily a university project issue. And we thought industry may be interested in paying for it. So we put that thing about it's, it could be an industry test bed. Um, but that was really not what we were trying to do. We were just trying to find some funding. So that, that's where that came from. Um, so we came up with a standard. And, and, and it's a very simple standard. And, and, and there's reasons for that. One, it's small. It's a PicoSat, um, one kilogram. Basically just a dimension standard. If you fit in this box, you can go fly. We didn't really tell people what to do and what to do inside uh, uh, because that was too much work. And we wanted a, a simple um, system that universities could man manage. Turns out that that's one of the good things because people came up with all kinds of different things to do with those things. Um, and we designed a, a deployer, and the students actually did it. Um, and the primary objective is to protect the launch vehicle, because we knew that that's what the launch guys were worried about. So put it inside a box, and maybe they'll, they'll give us a, a, an easier time going up. Um, and it's extremely simple. It's, a, it's the world's most expensive jack-in-the-box. Uh, so you have a, a pusher plate with a spring. You put the satellites inside. When the door opens, they come up. They come out. 
and it fit three CubeSats. And a lot of people have asked, why three, why not four, what five? And a lot of these things are very scientific. Uh, in that, that was about the room we had on a Delta II secondary space. And we actually have never flown in that, in that particular location. Um, but that's, that's why it is. Uh, same thing with the, with the size. We were looking for a PicoSat. Electronics in a spacecraft about the density of water, one kilogram, one liter, it's a cube. It, it actually made sense. All the sites are the same which means you can put solar panels on all of them. If we made it long and skinny, then some of them don't fit. So it wasn't really important why it is 10 centimeters. It's just something that we felt you could build a Sputnik with solar panels. And that's all we cared about. And a lot of people have asked me, oh my gosh, why did you guys come up with that precise? It could have been something completely different. Uh, we violated the standard immediately, so the tradition uh, in aerospace that, that, that standards don't work is correct. Um, and actually, the, the Jamie, I'll give you guys credit, uh, Stanford put out the standard and violated immediately. Um, so, so in the first launch in 2003, we had what now is called a 3U CubeSat, which basically took the entire space inside the, the pea pod. Um, the nice thing about those changes is that it didn't change the pea pod. So the launch vehicle compatibility was still there. And the reason for that is that the Peapod has solid walls. And at some point, you get to the wall and you cannot grow anymore. And, and that actually was an in interesting feature that we didn't expect. That actually maintained the standard, because people physically could not go beyond that enormous violation of the standard, Jamie, um, that we did on the first launch. But, but, but that, was, that was as far as it went, so we were OK. Um, and it worked. It actually was successful. We have, he had 75 plus. I've stopped com counting because it's, it's a continuous barrage now. Um, we launch from everywhere, and it's not we, just the community. Uh, we have uh, launches in the US, in India, and in Russia. Vega launch uh, is not in Europe, it's South America, but it's a European launch vehicle. Um, and truly, it's a regular launch scene. Every month or two or six months, there's a launch. Uh, somewhere. Um, so it's very hard to keep up with it, but, but it's very nice to see that happen. That's actually one of the Russian launchers we did at the beginning. That's CP4, which Aerospace Corp took a picture of. So that's a CubeSat taking a picture of a CubeSat. And those are actually the ones that Jax had released from the space station a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't put the space station in there because it's, it's in orbit. So we also launched from, from Earth orbit. Um, and the other thing that is impressive is that we have a very large developer community. We have universities and governments and industry, and it's worldwide. Everybody's doing CubeSats. We have dedicated workshops. And one thing that I'm very proud of is that we brought in a bunch of new players. And that's actually true from the beginning. Uh, new countries and new universities, people that had never thought about launching spacecraft, were some of the early adopters of the standard. It was like, we do that or we cannot do anything. And, and, and they actually started pushing for, for those small satellites and kind of brought everybody else along. University of Hawaii, Montana State, in Taylor University in Indiana, places that, that you never think as the traditional satellite powerhouses, especially at that time, um, jumped on board and, and did that. So awesome, everything's great. Um, and it went beyond student projects. Now, we have all space agencies that are interested. We have science CubeSats. The DOD is doing CubeSats. And I don't know exactly what they're doing, but because they won't tell us. Um, there is an industrial base. There is companies that make specific CubeSat products that you can go buy. So it's this whole new ecosystem that has evolved. And it, it's awesome. And everything is really, really good. But let's rewind a little bit. And that's, the, that's an interesting part of the story that, that it's sometimes hard to to phantom where we were at the beginning. So let's look at the year 2000. What was the industry saying about CubeSats? They're just a toy. And these are all quotes. I mean, industry people said this. They're too small. You cannot do anything useful for them. Um, there are no flights for secondaries. You, standards, they don't work. We know that for a fact. You cannot go to Russia. That's, that's not a, something that can be done. Oh, and by the way, there is no funding. So that's, that's where it stood in the year 2000. We put out this standard, and it's an unequivocal failure. 
Okay, it's something nobody wants. Maybe. And then you see people doing things like this, and this is this is again, people did say that. That's where the CubeSat power and mass for payloads is. There's basically no payloads in that range. We cannot launch anything. So it's really not a useful thing to do. Um, if that's the spacecraft technology roadmap, that's where CubeSats were. <laughs> okay? We're, we're way off road, out there in the mountains somewhere. Um, and this is really where we were. And, and quitting looks smart at this point. You know, it's not um, a logical thing to say, this is not going well, let's go do something else. Um, and actually, that's one of those things, and I'll talk a little bit about this. At this point, this was, for many faculty, this would be a 10-year catastrophe. You, you want to stop and go do something else, because you're headed for a disaster. Um, so why did it work? Okay. And this is, at this point, I'm starting to be really subjective. Okay. This is my opinion. Uh, we may never know the truth. It was a brilliant idea. Okay. <laughs> No. What I've discovered is that crazy ideas become brilliant when they work. They remain crazy if they don't. Um, so it was not a brilliant idea yet. Uh, it may have become a brilliant idea later, but it wasn't a brilliant idea at the time. We were lucky. We were just flat out lucky. And actually, we were not. That's the second CubeSat launch. <laughs> That's 14 CubeSats in a big hole in Kazakhstan. That's the day I was ready to quit. Okay, because truly the entire funding stream for CubeSats was in that hole. Um, we had 14 universities that struggle um, and put, you know, $40,000 down to go fly on the Dnepr, who had never failed, and it put itself in Kazakhstan. So I don't consider ourselves lucky. Um, so what happened? And I think. The educational focus was key to this thing working. Okay? Um, we didn't care that industry didn't like it because we could perform the educational mission on this really small form factor that couldn't do anything else. Um, and what really happened is the universities demonstrated that you could do more than people thought. And then industry jumped in and said, oh, wait, this is really interesting. Let's go, let's go do it. Um, but we didn't need him to agree with us before we get moving. And that, that's actually a very interesting thing. And it may have implications about some of the ways we fund and look at research activities. You know, that off the roadmap, way off the roadmap activity that sometimes gets neglected. That may be the one that will become a brilliant idea if you, if you let it grow. The other thing we had, we had students. <coughs> And, and, and that's, I cannot emphasize enough how important it was that these were student satellites. For one thing, pizza is a lot cheaper than, than engineer salaries. Um, and these people are crazy. They really will take risks. They don't care. Um, I mean, you know how they drive. That's the same thing. Um, <laughs> They're very creative, they're very enthusiastic, and they have no experience. So they don't know that they cannot do this. So it was, it was a really interesting group of people that made this happen. And, and the one thing that's very interesting, this is kind of an aside, those people are working with you right now, they're still crazy, so watch <laughs> out. Um, because they are truly contaminating the industry. Um, because that experience was very important to them. Um, more things. Um, a good factor is that there was no funding. That was actually a positive, because nobody could stop it. NASA could come and say, this is a bad idea. OK, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, so as long as we were willing to continue, it was OK. The other thing that was very interesting is that it forces, forced us to collaborate. That Russian launch what was an impossibility for a single school to do, because a lot of the funding was 
a bunch of deans and a bunch of universities writing a check to say, yeah, I'll give you 20K to go fly a spacecraft for my school. Uh, but you could only do it if you could go to a bunch of schools um, because you couldn't get half a million from any one of them to go fly a mission. Um, and the other thing that happened is that new players were into this. So there was a lot of people that were doing this that wouldn't be doing it otherwise. But the people that were doing it already had funding, so they were committed to do something else. Um, and, and, and that didn't allow them to, to go jump into the CubeSat um, game. So, so that was an interesting thing. Standardization is a related issue in that we had everybody working on the same uh, problems, so collaboration was very easy. Somebody would solve a problem and go, oh, I figured this out, and then tell everybody. And then we share our resources and we share our problems. Um, primary payload and launch vehicle protection, that was probably the only thing that you could say we were smart about. Um, that was smart, that we, we really focused on that and said, let's make sure that we, that we give the, the launch vehicle guys a good warm feeling that we're not going to break anything. Um, it was critical that we went to Russia. Um, the State Department was actually great when we first said, we're going to go to Russia. People were laughing because it's like, there's no way the State Department's going to let you guys go. Uh, they were actually really good. They understood very quickly that we were not a threat, that the technology was not going to make the Russians you know, come and, and make the NRO obsolete. So they, they really helped us, walked us through the projects and walked us through the problems. And in some cases, did things to help us that industry has said, oh, they're not supposed to do that. Uh, but they did it anyway. So they were really, really helpful. Um, and then we've actually been riding on the commercial electronics revolution, the low power, high performance electronics um, that the students didn't know you cannot use in space uh, have actually changed things. Uh, and I remember Bob Twiggs always talks about going to Japan and talking to a university that said, we're going to put a camera on our CubeSat. And it said, oh, you're going to do that. Um, that that's, that's, you don't have the room for that. And XI4 put a cell phone camera that launched in 2003, and it's still taking pictures. So, so they were right. Uh, you can do it. Now, one thing that I want to point out is, is that industry interest was a second step. Okay? The first step was the universities. And to a, to a large extent, we're done. We know why it worked. Once we had universities, not in mass, but in large numbers, developing CubeSats and launches, even though rare and in Russia available, that means we've, it works. We, we have succeeded. But there's been the big explosion has come on the next step where industry has become interested. Um, why? Well, one is the commercial electronics. They're also riding that wave. The other one that's really huge is frequent launch opportunities. The, the idea that we're going to launch every six months, and if we miss this launch, we can go on the next one, that was never available to the space industry before. They never had the option of, ah, no, I'm going to skip that launch. I'll take the next one. That, that's unthinkable. And, and that really changed, changed people. So it changed the risk posture, which means you can use all these new technologies. Because I can, I can fail, and it's OK, because the money is not there. And, and that also allowed the, the performance to go up. Those new electronics really allowed performance to go up. So one way to look at that, that, that industry roadmap, it's really nice, but it was kind of bugged down. You really didn't have a lot of access. And you didn't have a lot of opportunities to go up. And actually, when that's like that, whoops, this is faster, <laughs> OK? So we stayed way out there in that single trail somewhere out there. But we found a really slick way to move that, use that to our advantage when the mainstream industry was having some issues. And truly, launch access was an issue for, for industry. Um, but, but again, that's a second step. Um, let me show you some examples of what that means. And, and SRI is great because they let me use this and they gave me all the data. But that, that's. That's when, when commercial electronics are in the trade space, and you're willing to take the risk to not go traditional space, rad hard, and all those things. This is an instrument um, that flew on, on a cosmic spacecraft. It's three liters in volume, 2.3 kilos, and seven watts orbit average. A box for the sensor, a box for the electronics. Each one of the boxes is bigger than a CubeSat. Um, that's what SRI made. 
that's a one-use system, a uh, 10 centimeter box. Um, it's a third the size, less than half the mass, less than half the power, and it matches the performance as far as scientific data sensitivity and quality. It's, it's not right hard, and there's some of those things that it doesn't do, but as far as how good the, the data is, it's at the same level. So that's very impressive. And that's one thing that started to happen, is people said, well, if I mess with my resources and I use a more optimized processor and change my con ops, all of a sudden, actually, I can do more things with CubeSat. So some of those payloads that didn't fit before, yeah, now I can use them. Um, and then people started saying, well, I can shrink my payloads and put them in that box because that's the way to go somewhere. Otherwise, I'm trapped in the traffic jam and I cannot go fly. So I may lose 10% of my accuracy, but I get to fly. And that's, that's a much better solution. So that was really good. Payloads were being optimized to fly in CubeSats. But the one that nobody expected is there was a bunch of new missions that were never on anybody's radar screen. Rax is a very good example of that, where, where people came up with ways of doing things that were totally out of left field and nobody was thinking about. So that, that payload map that we created at the beginning to show that we cannot do this was missing probably 50% of the payloads that are now being developed for CubeSats because nobody had thought of them yet. So, so that's an interesting uh, concept. And then a lot of people have asked me this question, so I decided to put it in just because. But is CubeSat a revolution or an evolution? And I thought about it for a while because somebody caught me at a conference and it kind of threw me back and I'm like, I, I don't know. I, let me think about that one. And, and, and it turns out that, that the small spacecraft, that's an evolution. That's actually something that's been happening. You know, Surrey made smaller satellites, NASA's making smaller satellites. The small is an evolutionary step. But there is a revolutionary part. And the revolutionary part is not on the hardware, but it's in the mindset. It's the idea that we're changing the way we look at the space business as far as risk tolerance, how we look at launches, um, the, the production numbers, the low complexity, low cost, single instrument missions that people are doing. That's the part that's really new and different from the way things were done before. The fact that they're small, yeah, it's interesting, but that alone would not have changed things. So, so that's my answer to that question, which, again, it's, it's my answer. Um, so let's look at the so what. Okay, what are the lessons learned from all this? Um, the first thing is don't ignore crazy ideas because they may be brilliant ideas someday. Um, but you don't know which ones are going to be brilliant. And, and that's really something that was very interesting. It's very hard to predict what the brilliant idea will be. And, and again, I know resources are finite and, and all that, but, but that's an interesting thing. And I've actually made it a personal quest. Whenever somebody comes and says, I want to do this with a CubeSat, I never assume, oh, you're crazy. You cannot do that. I've stopped saying that. I may say it's difficult, but I'll never say it's crazy, it's never going to work, because I've, they'll prove me wrong. Um, innovation is unexpected. You don't know where it's going to come from. Cal Poly was not even doing space when we started this. We were an aeronautical engineering school. Um, we were completely outside the, the roadmaps. That, that's, that's actually a dangerous thing. When you, when you make them too rigid, that's a problem because you're missing, you're missing that single trail that gets you there faster. Um, new players are many times the ones that will bring this innovation to the table. And since they've never done that before, you're not even talking to them. So that's, that's another dangerous thing. Uh, you know, what's some little kid in Kenya doing right now that it's going to scare the gajivas out of us when, when we see what they're capable of? And, and by the way, they are, because I know the Kenyans are working on this. Um, and usually, innovation initially is likely to be ignored. So nobody's going to pay any attention, which in, some, in our case, it was good. We just flew under the radar. Um, but that's something that, yeah, my thoughts. Um, you have to question standard practice. You cannot assume that standard practice is rigid and it's going to stay like that forever. 
at some point you may have to just look at the book and say, okay, mil spec, whatever, does it still make sense? And, and it's a very nice safety blanket for people to say, I understand what I'm supposed to do, but things are changing so rapidly today that things become obsolete in years, not decades anymore, and, and, and that's sometimes months. So it's, it's very hard, so that, and that's hard to do. It's hard to say, this is the way I'm doing it, I'm comfortable with it, let's throw it away and do it a different way. That, that's a very difficult uh, problem. And I think that's a large reason why innovation comes from new players that don't have the baggage and the investment in the previous uh, way of doing things. Um, the other thing is small teams are really powerful. This was all done by relatively small groups of people. We didn't have hundreds of engineers. In many universities, they didn't have dozens or tens of engineers. Uh, we started with five people in manufacturing engineering doing a competition project. That was the peapod. And it was just a small group of people just trying to do something that nobody cared about. Um, so those small teams are very, very powerful. And the other thing that happens is you really can integrate quickly and, and effectively when you have that small team. So that, that has been something we've learned that it's very, very powerful. Um, more lessons learned. This is a biggie. What's worthwhile academic research? Can you do applied research with undergrads that's worthwhile? Well, yes, CubeSat came out of that. But it's not what people thought as this is academic research of high quality. Um, so how do we handle that? I don't know the answer, but that's something that I, I realize now that that's a problem. Um, there was no clear path for publication. That there is no way, now, now we can, but it wasn't fast enough for, for the academic career. Um, and it was unfunded, which is also something that, that is not usually what you want to do. So clearly it was worthwhile, we know that now, but at the time it was very hard to identify. So how do we allow that to happen and give it the recognition it needs when you don't know if this is a really crazy one or it's gonna be a brilliant one? So, so there's something there. Um, is academia crazy idea friendly enough? And, and that's kind of a weird concept, but, but, but truly, are we allowing truly crazy ideas to be taken forward a few steps, see what happens? Um, and again, it goes back to that, are, are your, if your results are wrong, you, you just committed academic suicide, you know, uh, career-wise. But that may be something, and, and then, can the rebels survive in this environment? Well, when they're successful, they can, but until they get there, we'll see. And then, are universities training the next generation of rebels? Are we generating people that can do the crazy things? And CubeSat at the beginning, we did very well at that because we were all nuts. I mean, we were all doing things that were completely crazy. Um, I would say now, I'm not so sure that we're really doing training crazy rebels because we, we've become kind of steady state, we know what we're doing we're more comfortable. So just, just food for thought. These are actually, I don't know if they're learned, they're lessons, but I don't know if they're lessons learned yet. Um, the other thing is we need to do cross-discipline collaboration. That's critical, it's fundamental. Uh, universities, we're very bad at this. Uh, we have these silos that we have created and just, it's very difficult. Uh, and we need to figure out how to do it because these would not be possible without these small teams being electronics and software and mechanical and orbits and everybody kind of working together and bringing the state of the art of their field into this different way of doing things or different area of research. So that, that's important. Um, a few more. And this is, is, is more of a, an industrial side. You know, we talk about academia, but these are lessons for industry. Risk is okay sometimes. There has been this aversion to risk, especially in aerospace, that may have actually slowed us down in the way we, we move forward. So risk is okay sometimes. It's not always okay, but, but it's okay sometimes. And, and that's hard to um, understand. Do, do not give up. That w I learned that. It's, it's actually true. We could have quit that, you know, made that big hole in Kazakhstan. I remember going home and saying, that's it. We're not gonna do this anymore. Um, and and it, was, it was a lot of people in industry that could not help us because their companies would not support it at the time. 
that kind of pulled us aside and said, what you guys are doing is really good, it's really important, keep it up. Um, and, and, and maybe I didn't give them enough credit, but there was, there was this, this underground resistance movement <laughs> inside the companies that nobody knew about, but they were really trying to help us. They couldn't. But just the fact that after that failure, many of them said, you guys made it to the rocket, nobody expected that. You got something here, do it again. Um, was very, very important. And it really helped us not give up. We could have easily given up at that point. Um, fun is important. We had a blast. Uh, flying things in space is really cool. Um, and, and doing it in an environment that, that it actually, it's okay if it doesn't work, we're just kind of having fun here. It was really invigorating. And, and I think sometimes now that we're funded and we're doing very well, we've lost some of that because, man, JPL really wants a report about IPEX, you know, and we have to do this and that. And it's not the same, but, but it's really an important motivator. And it's a huge motivator for young people. I've heard way too many older people like myself complaining about young people these days, you know? Uh, they don't work hard, they don't do this. Uh, but but I, I look at, you know, those, those, those downhill mountain bikers, you know, I go riding and I see them and I'm like, man, those guys are nuts. Um, and, and they're hurting themselves and they're still doing it. So, so they're not wimps. They'll work really hard if they think it's, it's worthwhile and if they're having fun. So that's, that's really an important motivator and I, I learned that. Um, Unintended consequences are not always bad. Sometimes they're good. So the idea of, oh, what's the worst that could happen? Well, we don't know, but maybe it will be good. So let's go do it. Um, so, so keep your eyes open for things that may be the, ooh, let's not do that because, you know, the famous devil's advocate thing? Um, not, not good. The other thing that I want to point out, and it's kind of like we're, we're running towards the end, but, but that's good. Um, is we've seen this before. We just haven't seen it in aerospace for many years. We saw it in aerospace when things were, you know, we're racing the Russians. We would do things like that. We, you know, Hitler just invaded Poland. Uh, everybody was, okay, we're gonna do this and we're gonna take risk and we're gonna do really fast and we're gonna try things left and right and center. Um, recently, aerospace has not been the place where that happens. We've seen it in the Apples and the Googles and the Facebooks and, and other industries have take the lead, taken the lead on outside the box, high risk, innovative, crazy ideas that nobody expected as opposed to aerospace. And, and I think we can take that back, but we need to kind of think in the right terms and, and kind of put ourselves in a, in a different um, mindset. And I think that's it. Yeah, and actually that's, that's an interesting picture because it's, it's, it's really good, first of all. It's high def, you know, cameras and all that. Um, but that's a picture of three CubeSats being deployed by a JAXA-developed CubeSat deployment mechanism from the space station, which is kind of the ultimate mix of low-cost, out-of-the-box, simple little things an enormous monstrosous traditional aerospace, um, but somehow they put it together and they're actually collaborating and making interesting stuff happen, which is really, to me, is the ultimate sign that CubeSats have arrived. Uh, we're playing with the big boys, but we're still maintaining our, our role as the, we're still gonna do crazy things, but we're no longer doing them outside the box, on our own, you know, in some little corner, we're doing it right there in full high def, you know, in the view of the astronauts. Uh, and, and we're not hitting the solar panels. We, we, we're doing it right. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's it. And, in, and now if, if there are some, I think we have, oh, perfect. We have the 15 minutes for questions that I, so we're there. We're done, thank you.